welcome. My name is Ellen Wolf. For those of you that I don't know, I'm a student here of Lama Yeshe Jimpas, and I've been at Lions Road Dharma Center for a bit. And I have the privilege of doing the talk this morning. Um, it's going to be a talk on this sutra that Connor just read, the Heart Sutra. Uh, but it's going to focus on some Tibetan script orientation. So, is there anybody here besides Connor that's been studying Tibetan? Okay, great. So, Connor, if you don't say much, then they won't know when I do it wrong. So, that's good. Um, and I'm going to use my laptop because I'm going to share some materials. I've also a little bit recruited Dirk to chime in because really the um, my objective in doing this talk is there have been a number of talks on the Heart Sutra, what, I'm, what I've sort of coined as a Heart Sutra Scholar Series. Jen's given a couple of them focusing on different things, and then Dirk did one from the perspective of, of Sanskrit. I don't know how many of you um, listened to that. And, and I've been doing a course where we've been doing a reader with this Heart Sutra. And what's inspired me is that sometimes in translating the Tibetan to English or just translating the Tibetan, studying the Tibetan, you realize that the English doesn't always say the whole story that the Tibetan does. So my thesis is sort of that these ancient languages can um, enrich in our study of these sutras and other materials. So. Um, this is usually when I would talk about all my qualifications for being able to talk to you today. Uh, but since I don't have very many, I thought I'd share a funny story. So I hope you'll tolerate a story. W some of you know that we had a retreat last weekend. So I was driving home from the retreat. It was like 7, 7.30. My car was full of all this retreat stuff. I was really tired and really hungry. So I stopped in Auburn, which is a little town on my way home. I don't know if you know Auburn, but it's a small town. And I stopped in Old Town, Auburn, which is like Old Town, Sacramento, or Old Fair Oaks, you know, lots of little shops and parking. And I pull into this, uh, where my restaurant, where I ordered to go food, to pick up some dinner, to go home, 45 degree angle. I pull in, I kind of bump the curb. Okay, I go in and get my food. I come out. And about the same time I back out, I start pulling forward. I notice my car's kind of pulling. And then I get this alarm, low tire pressure. And, and it shows me the data. I have kind of a, a new car, so it shows me the data. It's just 32, 32, 32, and zero. So I know that I've like, like really smashed my tire. So I pull over into a new spot, and um, and of course this is a car that doesn't have a spare. And even if I had a spare, what am I going to do? Unload all this retreat stuff onto. So I you know got my card and call AAA, and I just I start. Oh, I was kind of tired. All right, so a little frustrating, but. I started feeling really lucky because they said the tow truck would be there in 15 minutes, which is pretty miraculous. And then also I'm pulled into this spot and they're like 12 or 15 spots down from me and they all happen to be empty, which is just phenomenal because you know what they're going to have to do. They're going to have to like pick the car up and put it on a truck. So sure enough, like 15 minutes later, this big truck pulls up. He pulls into those spots, backs up, and this guy gets out and he looks so happy. He's just like smiley and happy and a, a sort of, you know, that sort of infectious happy that somebody is. So I get out of my car and I say, thanks, you know, to come pick me up. And he said, I'm so excited because this is my first call on my own. And I'm going, I'm going great. And then all of a sudden it hits me with this dude here. <laughs> he's never picked up a car before and he's going to try to put my car on this truck. So I started getting a little nervous, but sure enough, he was so happy. He just like drives the car right up, straps it in. I'm looking at the straps. And, and I got to get in the car because I got no way to get home. So I get in the cab of the tow truck and I start chatting him up. And I said, so so you haven't been doing this very long. He said, no, no, it's just a few weeks and I've been riding with somebody to learn everything. And I'm thinking, all right, all right. And I said, so what did you do before this? And I thought he was going to say, oh, I drove heavy equipment, forklift, you know, garbage truck driver. He said, I worked in a crematorium. And I'm thinking, this guy really has no experience with driving tow trucks. Not only does he not know how to drive tow trucks, but I mean, if we really perish, at least I'll have the experience of loading my body into the. So, anyway, super nice guy. And he drives me to my favorite tire store. And then the Uber's like three minutes away. I get an Uber and I pull out the cold food bags that I have in my laptop, my purse, and I go home. So it turned out really well. And I actually have Susan to thank because had we not chatted for an hour or so after the retreat, all those spots in Old Town Auburn wouldn't have been empty and I would have been really stuck. So thank you for that. 
So I find that because that's about how qualified I feel to give this talk. <laughs> I'm not really an expert on Heart Sutra. I mean, I have no real qualifications other than others of you that have read it a bunch of times. And I've, I only know like this much Tibetan and I'm a pretty bad Tibetan student. So, but I think it'd be fun. And I think part of my goal is to show you that you can have an appreciation for it and consider learning a bit about it, even if you don't feel very qualified. I, in fact, I mean, like Dirk's told me before, he, he said, I never would study one of these languages if I didn't ha already have studied like Latin or, or Greek or something. I, I mean, I was an engineering major. I took, barely took one English class in, in college. So I'm really not good at Tibetan. But anyway, I've been inspired to learn it. I think, or to study it, I should say. And one of the things that's inspired me is sometimes we have this Tibetan text in our, in fact, when I started, I think we had it in our prayer book. I don't know if anybody else remembers that. But I always wish I knew what it said. You know, and sometimes we say these Tibetan words and you don't really know what you're saying. And for me, in learning the Dharma, it I always just really want to understand it. You know, I don't want to just like surface it doesn't help me. I really want to understand it. So, um, but uh, I, I mentioned I'm a student of Lama Jimpas. He's been very inspirational in just studying. I mean, who knows really to set out to study the Heart Sutra? We just start reading it like Connor did, and it sounds like a strange, very strange thing. And so it makes you a little cur curious, but he's really inspirational to just keep going. You know, if you just keep going, even into the unknown, you're going to benefit yourself and others. So, um, uh, the other, I guess I give a lot of credit to my Tibetan language teacher. His name's Lama David Curtis, and he's a really interesting person if you don't know of him. He grew up in Montana. He got interested, I don't know how, I'd like to hear this story sometime. He got interested in Buddhism in the late 70s, and he started studying a bit and listening to the Dalai Lama a little bit in the 80s. And then he studied in college ancient languages and religions and such, and then by late 80s, early 90s, he went to France to a Dharma center and started in a monastery, started studying there and, and ended up doing a three-year retreat. And when he came back from that, he went to LA and started teaching Tibetan. Um, and so he's been teaching Tibetan. He traveled around the country uh, for years and years and finally came back to Montana and um, teaches through the Tibetan Language Institute, which he founded. And he also has a Dharma center called Big, I think it's a big sky mind. Um, and when I first started, it wasn't that long ago, 2017, I took my first class, but it was, I mean, it doesn't seem that long ago. It was on telephone. You dial up on your landline and put it on speakerphone, and he would talk, you know, and he'd have handouts, and then you'd mail in the, in the U.S. mail your homework, and then he'd correct it and mail it back to you. And now he's gotten really good on Zoom. It's really, you know, really a very professionally run class, so... So that's, uh, those are really my sources, uh, a couple other sources along the way. So just a little bit on the Heart Sutra again, which I don't know that much about, but, um, and Dirk can chime in and anybody else, that, Dan, anybody else that knows this well, uh, my understanding is the first, that there's a long version of the Heart Sutra, you know, and the one we do is a short version. And the first known written version of the short version is like 600, 700, uh, CE, Common Era. And there's some debate about whether the first one was in um, Chinese or Sanskrit. It wasn't Tibetan. So Tibetan is like twice removed. You know, it was, took a long sutra, and then that long sutra went to Chinese or Sanskrit, and then it got translated in Tibetan. So the Tibetan version, the short one, is still a couple times removed from the original Heart Sutra. But I think that's kind of interesting. Um, and then, uh, in terms of Tibetan, the Tibetan, just like a little short version of Tibet, Tibet, you know, I don't know the history of Tibet particularly, but about that time, 600 CE, the emperor Tibet sent somebody to India to bring back the Dharma. And that person went to India and studied a lot and a lot, came back, and, and that person was responsible for inventing the Tibetan language, essentially, to, um, to better transmit the Dharma. So that, I think that's kind of cool, too, a whole language that was invented for the Dharma. So pretty, pretty interesting, I think. 
So it's just a little, a little bit of history. So um, what I thought I'd do is do a little introduction to the Tibetan language so you all can be schooled on Tibetan. Um, teach you one word in Tibetan. You can learn one word, right? Um, and then we would read through the Heart Sutra in Tibetan using the phonic. You know, sometimes you see the Tibetan script that's all, you know, hieroglyphic sort of, but then it's, it's sort of spelled out in, in uh, English letters, and we can read it phonically in Tibetan. Um, and then what I've coordinated with Dirk on a bit is we've picked a couple examples where in my study I found that the English word doesn't always tell a whole story about the sutra and that I've found it interesting to read it in Tibetan. And so um, I'm going to show you those and then Dirk also maybe will hopefully will comment on what he understands about those terms from the study of Sanskrit. So a little bit of comparative analysis. And then at the end, we have a game. Aren't you excited for a game? And with prizes. Okay, so now I'm gonna share, um, share a PowerPoint presentation. I'm gonna try to share a PowerPoint presentation with a little intro to Tibetan. Are you ready? It's gonna be fun. Okay. Um, This. Okay, so these are the root letters of Tibetan, and they're sort of the consonances of Tibetan, and there are 32 of them. So, um, and the other thing that I think is interesting about Tibetan is it's very compact language. So there are lots of things that are done to letters and combinations of letters that, that then would result in like three or four English words maybe. So 32 um, consonances. Root, root letters. And then um, to make vowels, you add a little symbol. So all these root letters have an inherent sound of the ah. So for example, this one here is a ta, ta kind of sound. And saying it by itself, it would be ta. So all these letters without any marking have a ah vowel associated with them. But you add these little symbols to them and they change it like E, U, A, you know, they sort of change the vowel. So instead of adding a vowel second letter to make the sound, they just add this little symbol. And then in addition, there are a bunch of punctuation marks like this, this line here. These little lines demarcate like the end of a sentence or the end of a, um, I don't know, a paragraph or a chapter or something. So there's like, there's a little bit of punctuation marks too. Okay, you with me so far? Easy, huh? Okay, this is the word you're gonna learn. Um, and these letters then can stack or there can be suffixes or prefixes. Combining the letters then make words or syllables. And then combining the syllables may make a word that has a meaning. So this um, is, it's got that ta that we, just learned by my cursor, this ta. And it's got a stack letter, and this is a sort of a sa letter, an S above it that sort of change, can change the meaning. And then it's got a vowel that represents a no, a, like a O. <clears throat> so it's sa, ta, 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 this is called a narrow. It makes an O, so it's to. And then this is another consonant that's kind of like ng, tong. So this is tong. And this is a consonant that has the, the sound pa. It's got no vowel, so it's a p with a a. So tong pa. Everybody say tong pa. Tong pa. It's a verb that means to be empty. So there, it's really a combination of a noun, tong, which means nothing, and then a, a particle, the pa, which turns it into this verb, tong pa. To be empty. Easy, huh? Tong pa. Okay. And then to this word, things can be added. There are a lot of particles used in Tibetan. So you can add it to take this, this verb and change it a little bit. So you add this let consonants ra, it's all like an R sound on the end, and it becomes tong par, which means emptiness. 
tong pa or emptiness. You still have the tong pa basic root to it. And then you can add another particle to the end. This is kind of like an A with a, um, again, a, an O vowel sound, O, to, to mean the end of a sentence. So all these particles do things to words. And I, I haven't learned them all, but, um, and so this happens to be tong pa o, which is at the end of a sentence. It just demarcates the end of a sentence. But each one of these has this tong pa in it. Are, are, you, are you following? Because this will be part of the key to getting a prize in the game. Okay. All right. You get it. But see, it's just it's not like it's not like rocket science. It's a lot, a lot to remember. Um so there are various forms of Tibetan. We can see this traditional Tibetan script, Uchin, and there's several. What's the other the kids one? Ume. It's like a simplified version. So there are always different Tibetan texts. And I haven't even delved into the the hearing, the speaking and listening and talking like Connor has, because there are a gazillion different dialects in Tibet too. So I'm not doing that. I'm just studying like, how do you read this and make sense and look words up in a dictionary? That's about how far I am in this language. But so what we were just going through is called Uchen. It's the sort of hieroglyphic text that we see. And then the phonic written out so that you can pronounce it is Tong Pa, like we learned. And then there's another kind of version of the language called Wiley, which is a little bit more specific. So if you remember uh, this stacked letter, I, I showed you this N, thing that looks like an N, but it's a S essentially. In Wiley, you would spell that out so that you could, it's very specific so one could look it up in a dictionary. If you left that out, then you wouldn't know that it's that particular word. So it's got more letters in it, but it's, it's just more, a little more technical. Okay, remember, Tongpa, you got it? Okay, I think that's the end of this, yeah. Um, so now what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna stop this share. Are you ready to read the Heart Sutra in Tibetan? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> share this again. Okay. Uh, let's see, I might not even have this open. Let me open this. Uh, on screen share and I don't want to share yet. Let me, sorry. This is, I got this from Latsawa House, which is an excellent source. Um, are we having fun? Okay, all right. Okay, so this one has um, the English, the Uchen, the phonics, and then, uh, I'm sorry, the, the Uchen, the phonics, and then the English. So let's go down a bit. Are you seeing this? There we go. Got to go down a little bit. Okay, are you ready? Okay, so... Gyakar Kedu Bhagavati Prajnaparamita Tridaya Bokidu. Scroll up. Chomden Dema Sherab Ki Parol Tu Chimpe Ningpo. Bamko Shiko. I don't really start into it. Chamden Dema, Sherab Ki, Parol Tu, Chimpa, La Chaksa Lo, DK Daki, Topra, Du Chikna, Chamdende, Gyalpo, Kabjabgo, Hongpo, Rila Gelong, Gigenden Chempo Dong Chong Chem Sempe Gendun Chempo Dong Tab Chik Tuk Zupte. Everybody okay? We're going too fast. 
Okay, Dete Chan Dende Zabmo Nongwa Zi Jawa Chu Ki Tam Jong Ki Ting Ne Zin La Nompar Zuk So Yang De Se Chang Chub Sempa Sempa Chempo Pakpa Chen Re Zik Wang Chuck Shiraki Paro Tu Chimpa Zabmo Chupa Ni La Nampa Ta Zing Pung Po Napo De Dak La Rang Rang Zin Ki Tang Par Nampa Tao Den De Sangi Ki Tu Se dang dempa shari bu cheng chub sumpa sempa chempo pak pa chen re zik wang chak la dike che ne su. Riki bu gang la la sherub ki paro tu chempa zamo chopa chepa dopa de jita la pa ja. DK CHE NEPA DONG CHONG CHUB SEMPA SEMPA CHEMPO PAK PA CHEN RE ZIK WANG CHUK KI SE DONG DEMPA SHERA DATI BU LA DK CHE NE SO SHARI BU RIKI BU AM RIKI BU ME GONG LA LA SHERA KI PARO TU Chimpa zamo chupa chepa dopa di dita lampa tawa jete. Pungpo napo de dak kyang rong zing ki tong pa nampa yak dak pa jesu tao. Zuk tom pa o tom pa ni kang zuk so. Zuk le tang pa ni yu zen me yin no. Okay, just a little break here for commentary. This, you recognize this word? Tang pa? There it is, emptiness, see? Yeah, I know what you're doing already. Okay, here we go. Tang pa ni le kyang zuk ze ma yin no. De zin du so wa dong du she dong du je dong nam pa she pa nang tong pa o shari bu de ta we na chu tom che tong pa ni ye de. And one of the reasons I suggested tong pa ni is it appears a lot. Empty, emptiness appears a lot in the Heart Sutra. So if you're going to learn a word, might as well learn that one. Sen ni mepa mek yepa mek apa dreame mepa dreame dong draw wa mepa dree wa mepa gong wa mepa o shari bu de ta we yanong tong pa yi le zuk me. Um, just another little bit of commentary here. And it's kind of sweet how this is. This this word may is a negation word. So you'll see in this part we're going to a lot of may. It's like because it's no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue. Okay, what are these you gave me? So wa me, du she me, du je na me, nam pa she pa me, mik me, na wa me, na me. She me, ru me, yu me, zuk me, dra me, dri me, ru me, ru ka, je me, shu me, du. Me ki gam, me pa ne, yi ka yi ka me, ya ka yi nam pa, she pa, Kam ki bardu yang me du. Marik 
kini marika pa zepa me pa ne gashi ne gashi zepe bardu yang me du dukla sorry duk na wa dong different okay and yeah there are little differences in fact I had a different version for a while and it was very different. So, okay, here we go. Duk na wa dong, kun jung wa dong, gok pa dong, la me, yeshe me, tog pa me, ma to pa yang ma du, shari bu de ta we ne chong chum sempa nam to pa me pe cheer. Sharab ki parol tu chimpa la ten ching ne te sem la drip pa me pe tak pa me de chin chi luk le shim chu de ne na neng le de pe tar chin tu. Do some do nam par zuk. Pe zong ye tom she kang sherub ki paro tu chimpa la ten ne lana mepa yang dak par zuk pe chong chub tu nyang par zuk par song ye so de ta we ne sherub ki paro tu chimpe nak rigpa chempo nak Lana me pa nak. Sorry, I got a scroll, Connor. Show, show them the book you're reading. He's got no phonics in his. Where were we? The mantra that equals. Ming yam pa dang nyam pe nak duk nal tam che rab tu zi wa je pa nak. Mid zoom pe na den par she pe te jete. Shar ki paro tu chim pe nang mem me pa. Te yata, recognize this. On gate gate para gate para sam gate bodhi so ha. Shari bu cheng chub sempa sempa chempo detar sherab ki paro tu chimpa zamo la la parjao. Dene chon den de ting ne ze de le zen te. Cheng chub sempa sempa chempo pak pa chen rezi wang chak le lak zho ze jawa jin ne lek so lek so riki bu de zen no riki bu de zen te jita kayu ki tempo Ba de zindu sherab ki paro tu chimpa zamo la she par jate zen ze zen senk. Sorry. De zin shek pa nam kyang jesu yi rang mo. Almost done. You hanging in? Cham den de ke de ke che kat so ne se dong dempa shari bu dong chong chem sempa sempa chempo pak pa shen rezik wan chak dong tom chem dong dempe ko de dak dong la dong ni dong La me yin dong dri ze she pe jik ten yi rag te chan den de ki sung pa la nyang pa to bu. You did it. Good job. Give yourself a hand. 
Good job, excellent. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, let me go back. Uh, perfection of, do you know, offhand? You have to use your mic if you're going to say much. <laughs> I know. Um, yeah, I'm mean just let me flip for a minute and see if I can figure it out. The other thing that's kind of interesting about Tibetan, which makes it difficult if you're trying to use one of these texts that has the English and then the phonics, is the subject object verb is flipped in Tibetan. So um, a lot of times the thing that's at the end of the sentence is written in English is actually the first thing you're saying. Um, Chom Dende, blessed one, I think it, what it is, a blessed one or blessing or something like that, because if you look at this previous one, the speech of the blessed one, Chom Dende. Um, so I think it's like blessed one or something like that. Bhagavan, yeah, it could be Bhagavan. All right, so what I was going to do now, I'm going to go back to share my um, presentation because I picked out just a couple examples um, where I found it kind of interesting how David, Lama David, my language teacher, translated the text or, or um, parsed it out for us so we could see what it is we're actually reading in Tibetan. Okay, so in the beginning of the Heart Sutra, like for example in ours, um, thus they hear at one time, the Bhagavan is dwelling on massive vultures, not in Raja Griya, together with a great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagavan was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomena. Straightforward, he's somehow like sitting there, concentrating, focused. And then in Tibetan, the way we just read it and the way Latsala House had it translated, at that time, the Blessed One entered an absorption on the categories of phenomena. So this, this uh, phrase um, can mean many things, you know, and if you just have one translation in English, you think it means just something. But if you look, either look at lots of translations, like Jen's done this, read the different commentaries, you'll either see description about it, you'll see different ways maybe it was translated or described. And so this is a page um, from these little parsing tables are what uh, my Tibetan teacher gives us, where he breaks down what we're saying into its parts. So you can see what does each word mean and how is it used. And um, so this part we're looking at, let's see, let's see this one. This underlined part here is the one that relates to that absorbed in. And so it could mean uh, meditative concentration. In fact, you know, it's kind of cheating because the Tibet, the Sanskrit word is actually samadhi. And even the Tibetan is an attempt to translate samadhi. And all these English phrases are an attempt to translate samadhi, where there may be not good phrases for it. But what I found interesting also, so I'm going to let Dirk comment on that in a minute, is there's another whole word here, the second phrase that's underlined, that doesn't even get translated into English. And it's this, um, this yin, let's see, yinpar, yinpar. It's like, what? Yong, oh yeah, no, no, no. yongpar. It's a whole adjective on the absorption. And it could mean equally, evenly, impartially. Um, and David Curtis described it as equanimously. So he's not just sitting there in samadhi. He's sitting there like a very equanimous, self-composed samadhi. And if you never read this, except for like how it's in our prayer book, this, you never know that there's more to it. And you see this pop up every now and then where there's actually more to it. 
And I don't know if you've ever been to a, a talk where one of the Tibetan teachers has come and give a talk, and they say a bunch of stuff, and then the translator will say like five words, and they'll go, oh, it must be like, some, like a shortened version. And that's sometimes I feel like what we're getting. So reading these texts, even like when I'm in this class, I don't understand the grammar, I don't understand all these particles, but I like the storyline of what's being told and what it means and how it, you know, it like adds color to it. So I, I'm going to pause and see if Dirk has anything to add about um, samadhi or if there's in your translations, Dirk, any sort of uh, adjective tacked on to this. Uh, yeah, would uh, actually it becomes very complicated. Uh, yeah. The uh, uh, the Sanskrit is way different from the Tibetan. Uh, also, uh, first of all, you've got genitive. You showed a genitive particle. We don't have any of that going on in Sanskrit. So, if you don't mind, I'll share my screen, and I'll try to be quick. I, I, I only focused on this one. I looked at the other one, but this is the one I focused on. Because what we have here, the phrase was absorbed in the concentration on a phenomena called profound perception. In Sanskrit, is Gambira Nama Samadim Samapana. And you see, everything there is a nominative masculine singular, except for Nama and Samadhi. And the samadhim is an accusative. So we have no anything except inferred. We have inferred particles because this gambira samboda, ava samboda, is a, a compound. So within this compound, you could interpret in various ways. So let's take uh, gambira as the first member of that. And that's what's being uh, usually translated as profound, I believe. And look at where it comes from. It comes from a man's navel, voice, and character as being deep. And so that, that of course, became meant something different later. But you don't find that in the Buddhist hybrid Sanskrit dictionary separate. So this is the Sanskrit meaning. Uh, basically, some way of describing depth. And then, and then Samboda. Um, perfect knowledge or understanding. So that's the, the bodha that's sam, together, full, complete understanding. And then ava, that ava, ava sam bodha is really one separate word from gambira. It's gambira, which doesn't have any particle, no, no, uh, it has no case. The case is determined by its relationship with sam bodha. Sam bodha has a case because it's sam bodha, which is the nominative masculine singular. Um, and then awa is another one added to that. Awa and sam are both uh, prefixes. And awa means down or away from. So one way you could look at this, and I'm just confusing it further, and I, I think it's good to be confused further. Because when we, I, you know, I did a reading group on Chandra Kirti. And the people that I was in this reading group with, we were reading those uh, first text in Sanskrit that was actually just found uh, relatively recently. Uh, and most of the people I was with just wanted to pin down one word for every word in Sanskrit. And I personally think that's a mistake. Because our English words, first of all, don't coincide with either Sanskrit or Tibetan. We uh, are translating from a culture that has a completely different worldview than the culture that we live in. So English grew up in a completely different culture. So what these words mean is, and also another thing that Sanskrit does, and I would be surprised if Tibetan didn't too, Sanskrit maintains, sometimes it's, it's purposely ambiguous. It's letting you have both interpretation. The word Tathagata is a great example of that. The word Tathagata can be either analyzed as thus come or thus gone. But I think it's both. Anyway, and most people will tell you it's one or the other, but I, I would say that it's both. So now we've got maybe down into perfect understanding is part of the phrase. And Nama, 
Nama is a very strange word. Nama can mean so-called, but it can also just mean like certainly, indeed. It can even mean it kind of in a in a in a way that throw casts doubt upon it. It's called this, but it's not really what it is. So Nama is a very very uh, very uh, term that you can kind of lay around with a bit, play around with a bit. And then samadhi also uh, in Sanskrit is uh, is another odd word because look at all look at all these possible connotations for it putting together joining you know a union whole aggregate and not until you get down here you get concentration of the thoughts profound understanding intense contemplation and this is probably our uh, our meaning here is absorption meditative absorption because that's the technical Buddhist thing, but it's 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 good not to take the word uh, absorption or meditation as we learn it in English and turn around and apply it to this text and think that that's what that word means. The word that we already think we know what it means, but we don't. And that's that's part of what I'm talking about here. And then samapanna, that's that last word. And uh, that's that's a past part of past passive participle in Sanskrit, which also actually does function as an adjective. But here, uh, according to Edgerton's hybrid Sanskrit dictionary, it has a technical meaning here of attained, even though you can see samapada to fall upon, attack, assail, undertake, occur, appear. Those are things, so we have a technical definition, but attain. So that changes the meaning quite a bit from what we have as a translation. If, if, if one way you could look at it literally, this it, it's hard to put together because we have all these nominatives and one accusative and one verb, and they don't necessarily easily make sense, see? which is always the problem with reading in Sanskrit anyway. But it could be deep down in perfect understanding called having been attained samadhi. So the, maybe the name of the samadhi is having been attained rather than perfect understanding. Anyway, that's, that's, that's my little piece on that. Hmm. Thanks, Derek. I mean, but, uh, that's kind of exactly my point is that if you just read one translation in English, you get a very narrow description. If you can get into the translations and stuff, you get a lot more richness out of it. Um, I had one more, and we'll do it kind of quick, because it's just, again, exemplifying this same quality to setting these texts in other languages. Um, so in this phrase, um, there's another phrase further along. In the same way, sensation, recognition, con conditioning factors, and consciousness are empty. And this um, conditioning factors is it can be translated quite differently across different versions of the Heart Sutra. Um, mental exertion, formation, predeposition, volitional factors, condition state, karmic dispositions, motivation. And this this is another one where you know maybe there's not a lot to say about it in Sanskrit because. Again, the Tibetan is a translation of the Sanskrit word samskara, and we don't have English words for samskara. Um, so I don't know, you know, do you have to study it in, in Sanskrit? Do you have to be from that culture to have a feeling for what samskara meant? Who knows? I don't know if you want to say anything about that, Dirk, but it's just another case where there can be so many different qualities to the word than just the one we might pick or the one the translation has. The also, some, the word samskara is interesting because it comes from the same root as the Sanskrit. As Sanskrit. San, they're both san with the verb kur, which means to do or to make. So uh, they're just different forms of that, of that verb put together. So actually in Sanskrit, samskara can uh, mean actually it's something that's put together something that's created uh and constructed uh the way the way edgerton, edgerton translates it in his buddhist hybrid sanskrit dictionaries as uh predispositions which i've always favored but 
uh, anyway, that's as you say, I'm just supporting what you're saying. <laughs> it could be all sorts of stuff. Right. Thanks. Okay. Any questions about? Yeah. Um, I would just say, like, agreeing with the conversation book about the specific vocabulary terms, because I know when I try to talk to my friends about, like, Buddhism, or especially with, like, the word uh, dukkha, like mm -hmm. the Sanskrit, and um, we typically tend to use in English suffering, but that can be, like, a very heavy word in English, so I know a lot of the times, like, I'll try to, like, illustrate it in, like, examples, so I'm like, well, suffering's heavy in English, so I'm like, it could also be, like, irritation, annoyance, mm -hmm. that little nudging feeling you get sometimes, little paper cut, and so, like, I'll try and use stuff like that, because, like, I feel like definitely, like, our translation of English that we picked for suffering for Dukkha is, like, one of those ones that's very limited. So, kind of, like, agreeing with, like, yeah, you're yeah. totally right. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Are you ready for your game? Do you remember the word? Tongpa? Okay, maybe I can get some help because I want to also put this file up on um, the chat so that people can play at home. So can somebody help me by handing these out? There, there's some of these. Maybe they're all. Some are two-sided and some are one-sided. Connor, you have to have a two-sided one because you made a bigger challenge. But um, it doesn't otherwise really matter whether you get a two-sided one or the, or the one-sided one. But you want to start with the yin word, the one that looks like a W on on the side. And if anybody needs a pen, I have pens. And if we don't have enough, then you can team up. You can team up. I'm going to stop this share. I'll put this word back up in case you need help. But let me stop share long enough to stick a file in here. Let's see. How do I do it? How do I do it? I don't remember how to do it now. <laughs> Dylan, do you think you can put that file? I can't remember how to do it now. How did I do it? Where's the add the file? I need to do it again because when I added it, initially no i don't want to show it i want to send it to them in chat oh yeah. again again because when i first sent it it was too early and not very many people had signed on and they can't see it well so i just need to upload it again how yeah. do i do it where was the where's the file at on your computer it's up i just can't find the little thing to uh yeah, go to that file thing. And what you want to do is look for that word. It's a word search. And they're going to need the variations too, right? There can be variations. So you just want to look for that word by itself or in, uh, in a longer form. Yeah, I'll, I'll flash it again in a minute. Start with the one that looks like a W. It has a W. It's, it's a yeah sound, but it looks like a W kind of. Um, I don't have one. Look on both sides. Okay, if you want to play at home, I've just uploaded the file that the people have in the room. Okay. All right. So again, you can find tongue pa. You can find tongue pa. Um, but it will always have that tongue pa as part of it. 
Any questions about the game? Do you want to know what the prizes are? Do you want to know what you want to work hard about? Yeah. Okay, we have a variety of prizes. We have uh, we have some satsas, medicine Buddha satsa, a chinrezi satsa you could have. Nice, huh? I have a couple. These are cool. A couple of mini prayer flags. A couple sets. Okay, these are the best. We have pictures of Lama Jimpa that are signed. We have... We have one from the retreat. Isn't that pretty? Signed picture. How many times? That'd be cheating. Yeah, that's cheating. You're trying to see it, find as many as you can. This is my favorite prize. Do you want to see? For those of you that were at the retreat, you'll understand this. Salama Jimpa with a squirt gun. gun. Signed. <laughs> yeah. And then we also have chocolate bars for those of you. And there's no judgment. If you pick a chocolate bar rather than a Lama Jimpa picture, it's okay. I'm playing. Don't have the right glasses. Don't have the right glasses. Okay. Any, any other excuses? Any better excuses than that? Any version. Any version. Just circle them. Oh, yeah, for sure. It's yours to keep. It's a souvenir. Has anybody found one? Okay. You found seven. Do you want a pen? Do you want a pen? Do you want to play? Who else? Oh. Are you slowed by not having pens? That would be all over this already. Yeah. You'd be done. <laughs> Anybody else need a pen? You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> Does it need to be bigger for you to see them? I need my reading glasses. Okay. All right. Anybody found two? No. Two? Okay. Have you found any, Doug? The first letter. Start at this side. Uh, start on this page. Do, do you have a pen? All right. Took it. Would that be it? Yeah, that's it. I found about eight. Yeah. I did find quite a bit, but not just that great. Look how. Like that, but then it's yeah, Tang Pao. That's the end of the sentence. It's a particle that denotes the end of a sentence. I better win. I'm not at all competitive. Found <laughs> any yet? A bunch of them. All over the place. Are you circling them or you want to? You know. Okay. How you doing? Did you find one? You don't have any circled. You're not. You have no faith in yourself. Uh, and let me turn this off. The, the vowel sign that designates the O is a nice way to find them, Long Tuck suggests. You guys online playing? Dirk's playing. You think you're finished. Did you find 27? No. 
are you guys, uh, let me know when your brain's getting tired. How many did you find? Nine. Nine. Holy cow, you guys are good. I, I have a key, but I don't remember what I counted, but nine sounds like a lot, so maybe you found some that don't exist. Seven. Seven. She's the, a Heart Sutra scholar, too. <laughs> you ready for the uh, answer key? No. Some are, some are not. 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Dun, 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 dun. And if we run out of prizes, then you can you can have your pick then. What's your preference? Yeah, check them out. They're two different ones, two different pictures. Okay, are you ready for the answer key? I don't know, let's go to the answer key. Just cause Shah is like very persistent, doesn't mean everybody is. Pass it around. Let's see, share screen. Uh, let's see, just open it. Prizes, prizes. Winner, winner. If I run out of prizes, then you can say which one you wanted and we'll get it to you. Uh, let's see. Hmm. I'm having technical difficulties here. Uh, All right, let's open sharing screen. Share. No, there, there are two or three with him just by a light. Okay, so there was one in like the third line. Tong Pa, you got that one? We got uh, another Tong Pa about halfway down. Okay, I'm not counting. And then we have a Tong Pa, and then the Tong Pa, the next one, and then right below it, Tong Pa, and another Tong Pa. Tong Pao and another Tong Pa. And on the back, there are none? Oh, there's one. Okay. I didn't do the key on the back, I don't think. Eight. Eight on the front and one on the back. There's supposed to be eight on the front. I don't know. You'll have to compare notes with Shaw when you're done. Boy, you guys really get into these games, don't you? We're going to have to start game software through next time. Oh, well, I don't know how about you guys at home, but these guys in the room, they're like going to town on this game. Um, so does anybody have any any questions? Otherwise, uh, it's all about prizes. Sorry if you're online. I have to mail the prizes. Maybe what we'll do is we'll um, just quiet ourselves for a moment and we'll do our closing prayers. And then these people in the room that are just going, 
wild over sets and chocolate bars can carry on. Would you? Thanks, everybody. Big fun. Ah, put the prizes in the chat, Dirk says. All right. Thank you so much. Um, this was great, and I think it's going to generate a lot more discussion afterwards. But let's do some dedication and closing prayers once we've got Dylan up to speed. Dylan has been partaking of the joy and fun of this, which is wonderful. He actually came down from the booth. He emerged. <laughs> All right. Due to these merits of the virtuous actions, may I quickly attain a state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel, Bodhicitta, that has not arisen, arise and grow. May that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Chenrezig, Tenzin Jiaozu, please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill their ultimate and ultimate goals. Lusong, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones, merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators, please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion, Nanjushri, master of flawless wisdom, Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Mara's, Tsungkapa, crown jewel of the Snowy Land Sages, Rosantrapa, I make a request at your holy feet. Uh, we have a couple announcements. Um, next week, we're doing Entering the Path and Refuge. If you've not signed up, please see Susan, Matthew, Patty, or Jen about the sign-up sheet. If you have questions, see those same people. Um, what else is going on? Yes, please sign up for Ling Rinpoche. Uh, you got, okay. You need to do that online. Uh, if you see the roar, uh, you can actually find that. Ling Rinpoche is going to be May 28th, but you need to sign up before then. 29th? Wednesday. Susan, do you want to? Okay. Okay. The question I have related to the 14th, there's also a uh, a book signing thing. Can somebody say something more about book signing and how to get the book and where's the book and what's the book and all that? <laughs> Don't steal my thunder. <laughs> okay, yes, um, on the 14th after the, the talk, um, at, I think it's during lunch. lunch-ish um well after the talk some point around lunch there'll be a book signing we'll have the books here we have 50 copies of um on becoming a buddha or roughly 50 maybe 45 and um they're for sale for 25 dollars and um lama will be here to sign them and what a what a blessing so um, after the signing, whatever. Oh. Maybe we should clarify, Jen, because I, I, I didn't talk to Lama it was up. on Friday and he wanted people to buy them ahead of time and then get them signed at the book signing. So w maybe we try to clarify and put out some more information about it. Yeah, that sounds good because, yes, I misunderstood that. Okay. We could send money in any time, so it will work out if we send money in. All right, cool. Well, so glad I could clarify all of this. <laughs> and, and so just to, to clarify, we can buy the books on the website by hitting the donate button. And in the drop box, the drop down box, there is a selection that says Lama Jimpa's book and $25. So, um, just to be clear, you can get it ahead of time, apparently, right? Because I did. Yeah, I think you don't actually get the book, but you've reserved a book for yourself, and then right. you'll receive it then. Okay, okay, all right. So anyway, that's also on Sunday. Yeah? Okay. 
<laughs> I don't know. It's it's in the roar. So I'm sort of I'm just was curious. Okay. The other thing I wanted to say is that in the back we have people who are taking refuge next week, which is Deb and Sharla and um, Jared. It's hard to travel with your children. Anyway, so I'm not going to share your kids' bedtime. Fine. I'm the first one, so I'm welcome and congratulations and stuff cards. So just FYI, if you want to get to those, that's all I have. Uh, don't have men's groups happening after Temple, but I don't know if there are enough men that want to come. So we have a pretty sparse group today. So come find me after we're done here, and we'll see if we have a quorum. Thank you all. Have a great week. Om Araya Pazaya Nayindi Om Araya Pazaya Nayindi Om Araya Pazaya Nayindi